I'm Praveen Swami, Group Consulting Editor at Network 18, and I'll be speaking to five TEDx Gateway speakers at First Post Studio in Mumbai. Parag Khanna is one of the most thoughtful commentators on geopolitics today. Uh, he's the author of several books, and he's from Kanpur, which means he knows some of the most colorful cuss words in the Hindi language, which he's unfortunately not going to share with us today. The reason I brought up Kanpur was actually that its streets are a useful metaphor for uh, geopolitics as we see it around us, uh, full of contested spaces, arguments, uh, and the breakdown of norms on how to handle uh, many of these conflicts that break out. Uh, we're delighted to have Parag at First Post Salon today, along with our digital partner, Geo. And we're going to discuss some of the strains on our global order and where they might take us. Ten years have passed since you wrote Empires and Influence, uh, Parag. And in those ten years, the global order as a whole hasn't done all that well. Uh, you talked about the rise of Asia, which has indeed happened. Mm -hmm. But China's neighbors today are wary of its rise. Uh, India and China are eyeing each other suspiciously. Mm -hmm. And even China's friends are starting to drown in debt. Um, where does all this head? Are we heading towards uh, settling down of this chaos? Mm -hmm. Or do you believe a period of anarchy and stress mm -hmm. lies ahead as many fear? It's a great question, but I think there's really a false dichotomy between taking a view that military and confrontation is one side and that's pessimistic and trade and integration is the positive, optimistic, alternative scenario. In the real world today, both of those things are happening at the same time. We're having border disputes. Fishing vessels are ramming each other in the East China Sea. India and China are standing off in Doklam. But we're also trading more with each other. China, South Korea, and Japan just got together and said, let's further liberalize our trade, right? India is the second, is the largest recipient of loans from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in Beijing. So we have to view, we have to accept this reality for the complexity that it is. And let's also remember that if there is a war, it doesn't invalidate the idea that Asia is integrating. Europe is integrated precisely because it had two major wars. The real way to look at it is this. If China and Japan have a conflict over the Senkaku Islands, someone is going to win that war, for better or worse. And once they do, the war is over. And then they move on with the business of integration, right? And that's the way history actually evolves. You're assuming, of course, that Oh, oh, that, that these will be wars that do not involve the use of nuclear weapons, that states will have the wisdom to contain conflict. Yeah, and the truth is level. that they have proven that they do have yes. the wisdom to not use nuclear weapons. And I think the, the more important assumption is that actually they're going to probably avoid those conflicts altogether. And one of the things that I documented in my Connectography book is that in the last 25 years, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, end of the Cold War, there have been nine major wars produced predicted also between nuclear powers, India and China, China and Japan, South China Sea, Iran, Taiwan, you name it, nine. None of those nine have happened. And the, even the, the reason that none of those nine have happened is not because we've suddenly become so mature and so enlightened. The reason is because of that other path that's being taken, where geoeconomically we're integrating and geopolitically we still have tension. And when push comes to shove, You've got the business communities and, uh, and, and, and all of the positive, all of the forces of integration calling up the political leaders and saying, you've made your point, now back down. Right? Connectography, that's, that's a really you know, interesting uh, sort of work you've done on a world where cities, trade networks become more important than national borders, national identities. And that's happening. We see it all around us. Right. But at the same time, we see the surfacing of a kind of ugly uh, a primal nationalism mm -hmm. across Asia, mm -hmm. and often involving exactly the same elites who are also integrating. Right. What sense do we make of this? Yeah. Which of these forces eventually wins out? Well, let's put this in historical context. Whatever nationalism we're seeing in Asia today that may be stoked by political populist leaders for the sake of winning elections is not quite the same extreme as, let's say, the Japanese imperial nationalism of the 1930s. <laughs> 30s that rapaciously pillaged East Asia, right? Sometimes we can be a bit ahistorical and forgetful about how bad things were. Right. Now, in other words, democracy has its pros and its cons, right? And on the positive side, you have more transparency, more inclusiveness uh, you know, of society and political decision making. On the other hand, you open the door to this kind of uh, populism. Populism and nationalism can be for the domestic consumption, right? It can be fear-mongering of external countries and 
neighbors. But it doesn't mean that there's necessarily going to be war. Again, in 2013, 2014, the Chinese people were burning Toyota cars on the streets of Tok uh, Beijing. Beijing. Did they go to war? No, they did not go to war, right? And far smaller things uh, in, on the eve of the First World War actually did stoke very significant conflict. And it can happen. You know, what I'm saying is that there are very tangible reasons why we have not had major power conflict in Asia in the past 25 years. And it has to do with the incentives created by the integration of Asians with each other through trade and investment and new diplomatic vehicles and infrastructure and so forth. This realization that we have spent so much in Asia in the last 50 years on our cities, on our industries, on building a high quality life, we don't want to see it destroyed by nuclear bombs or war. And when, again, when push comes to shove, the leaders in Beijing, the leaders in New Delhi, the leaders in Tokyo, the leaders in Seoul are saying, okay, we've made our point, we've drawn lines in the sand or in the water, we've asserted ourselves, uh, we've catered to our domestic audiences and constituencies to make sure they reelect us, but we're not gonna let our cities get destroyed. And again, that's that very important countervailing force to the idea that there's some automatic logic between national interests and borders and alliances and World War III breaking out. Because if it weren't for those forces, World War III would definitely have broken out by now. And here's the other sort of odd thing happening in Asia, which is the rise of new nuclear powers. Right. Uh, India and Pakistan, of course, two decades ago. Sure. Now you have North Korea joining the club, maybe Iran in the foreseeable future, who knows? the Saudis, right. uh, but clearly in Asia, more than in Europe after the Second World War, states see their survival, regime survival as being linked to the possession of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Is this a force for stability that makes war impossible or does it add to the mix of unpredictable, volatile things that might go wrong. So there's theory and there's practice. You know, in theory, actually, nuclear weapons proliferation can promote stability because it's a, such a significant deterrent. You only need one. North Korea now knows that it can deter anyone with one or two nuclear bombs or six or seven. And now, therefore... And just to explain yeah. uh, to our audience, it's, there's a very simple reason for that. You don't want to sacrifice the single city of Seoul, right? Right. For any conceivable... Well, or San Francisco, or, or I San might add. Francisco. If you attack Seoul, the nuclear fallout will certainly blow north into North Korea, so that's not very productive. <laughs> so let's think about why you have this opening to North Korea today. I've been to North Korea, and I was writing five, six years ago about how this incremental integration through supply chains and railways and factories and industrial zones would gradually shift the calculus of the North Korean government. That, plus nuclear weapons, means that they have a certain degree of protection, that they're not going to be invaded by China or invaded by South Korea, which is, of course, what they've been telling their people in order to remain the legitimate authority in the country. Now they're saying, we've got our nukes, we're getting money, let's roll with this, right? Let's keep our stability, but let's get rich through trade and integration. Again, perfect example of this theory at work. I'm hoping that eventually it will work with Iran as well. If Asians were in charge of diplomacy with Iran rather than the United States, you would have had Iran reconnected to the Silk Roads a long time ago, rather than 40 years of isolation that has not changed the regime. The other sort of last big thing that's changing in Asia as we speak is that this sort of youthful energy that's yes. underlain Indian growth and Chinese growth is changing. Yep. China started graying. Yep. India within the next decade uh, will we'll sort of emerge from its youth bulge period and start graying. What kinds of impacts are those likely to have on, on this region? Right. Well, first of all, it's interesting about China. People describe it as aging and put it in the same category as South Korea or Japan. But because China's population is so big, it actually has more young people still than any country in the world. Of course, only India is right behind there, almost the same number of young people, but it's about the median age. China's median age is like 46, India's is like 30, right, or something like that. So that helps to explain why you have such a huge shift in foreign investment and labor into Southeast Asia and South Asia, right? And the lower labor costs, younger, youthful uh, dynamic there. Now, India is already growing faster than China. And in the next uh, 10 years, if South and Southeast Asia, these countries that really form a belt, 
you know, uh, under China. If they grow at even half the rate, even though, again, they're growing faster than China already, but even if they grew at half the rate that China has, yes. it will be as big as China in the next 10 years. That's how important these markets are, and demographics have a lot to do with it. And also, this gets back to the whole Asian dynamic. Sure, we still have our territorial tensions, but guess what young Indians and young Filipinos and Indonesians are doing now? They're moving to Japan and to South Korea and even to China to compensate for the graying of those countries. You even have a demographic integration that's starting to happen in what we have traditionally been fairly homogenous societies. So again, there's a lot of positive news that doesn't make the headlines, but it points to these forces where there's restraint. You know what's happening, there's so many Chinese in Japan. The largest number of immigrants into Japan are Chinese. And so they become a force, actually, that tells China, hey, back off. Yeah, we are living here. Don't bomb us, right? We're Chinese. I'm not kidding, by the way. And this is not the kind of thing that uh, we thought would happen between Asians, but the demographics sort of drive it in that direction. Again, more integration. A final question. What does Donald Trump mean <clears throat> in the United States? I mean, the United States has been the pillar of the international system now for a century. Yeah. Um, Trump comes in and appears, at least by the, looking at the headlines, to sort of threaten to upend the whole thing, yeah. to stand the world on its head. Yeah. Is this just a flash in the pan, or is this something which is going to have durable impacts right. on the international right. system? You know, it goes back to the first point. The world is quite stable in its multipolarity. That means that no one power, not even the United States that has historically dominated the system, is going to be able to topple the whole thing, nor does it want to. It just wants to cling to its centrality, but it's a little bit too late. If you look at the volume of trade between Europe and Asia, it is $500 billion per year, more than either of them trade with America. So the Eurasian system is the new center of world order already today. I'm not making some hypothetical prediction. Today, right now, America is the third most important trading power in the world. So whatever Trump does may help to revive America, revitalize America. At the moment, it seems to be doing the opposite. But, and whoever comes next, could rip up Trump's you know, bad behavior and say, we want to re-engage with the world. It's not going to change the fundamentals of supply and demand. Where are the people? Where are the technological shifts? Where is the youthful dynamism energy? Where are the supply chains moving, right? They're not going to suddenly relocate back to America and put and elevate America again. So I actually am fully confident in the patterns of the system and their ability to withstand even Donald Trump. And quite frankly, they have withstood Trump very well. He didn't join the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. Everyone else decided to join the Trans-Pacific Trade, Trade Agreement. Agreement. He told every European leader not to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Even Obama did as well. They did it anyway. Everyone is doing what is in their best interest, and not many countries are actually listening to Trump. And that's part of what makes the world stable, is the predictability that countries are going to do what's best for them. And what's best for them is more connectivity. But I'll, I just uh, to thank you for joining us at First Post Salon with our digital partner, Geo. We look forward to reading more of your work and hearing more of you in India in months and years to come. Thank, thank you. you. Looking forward.